looking at a particularly relevant freeze from the forum transitorium. That's going to help narrate this particular festival, five-day festival in the month of March, dedicated to Minerva. So it's the Quinquatria Festival, or also known as the Quinquatris Festival of Minerva. And we're gonna talk about the goddess. We're gonna talk about how she is venerated, who's doing the venerating. In particular, the festival comes into sharp focus under the reign of Domitian, not everybody's uh, favorite uh, emperor, but uh, someone who left his mark on the city of Rome, particularly with his massive palace on the Palatine Hill that gives us the word palatial and palazzo and palace. We'll then focus on the Forum Transitorium that we just had a view of. We'll talk about the festivities in the city of Rome. And then we're gonna go out under the reign of Domitian to Albano, to the Alban Hills, Castelli Romani, to see what Domitian did to add to the festivities because Minerva was his particular patron goddess. Okay, so Minerva and the festival. Minerva is obviously a key goddess in the uh, city of Rome. You just think of the Capitoline triad. You have Jupiter, you have Juno, and you have Minerva. This is an Etruscan triad that the Romans uh, go with. It's the ultimate triad. But she's going to have other cults and shrines throughout the city. The most important one is the largest one is going to be on the Aventine Hill and the festival day is going to be on March 19th. So we have this one day festival, which at least by the time of Augustus, according to Ovid, is extended to five days total. And the main people that are interested in this festival and really participating in this festival are going to be the artisans. And that makes total sense because like Athena, Minerva, goddess of wisdom, is also the goddess of arts and crafts. And here we have a really nice uh, relief block that's found at the base of the Capitoline Hill. It was decorating some sort of monument, temple, or maybe part of the decoration uh, associated with the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. It's depicting then men that are working in their workshops as carpenters. Fabri Tignari. The Tignari is referring to the woodworking. The Fabri is referring to the term for workmen. And who is that larger than life figure on the far left? Is the goddess Minerva. So you go forward to the Christian era and you have patron saints. In the in ancient times, you had patron gods and goddesses overlooking the various uh, disciplines uh, and uh, and, and jobs that you had in antiquity. So for the Romans, it was Minerva who was patronized by smiths, tailors, cobblers, etc. We have inscriptions as early as the second century BC that are referring to a collegia or association of actors and scribes that are venerating Minerva on the Aventine Hill. Ovid is gonna mention in his Fasti, his calendar, uh, epic poem uh, in the month of March, he mentions also the shrine of Minerva Capta on the Kylian Hill. But the person that brings it all into sharper focus is Domitian, son of Vespasian who built the Colosseum. Here's an image of a uh, laurel crowned Domitian in the foreground and in the background, that's dad. That's Vespasian who built the Colosseum. The mission succeeds Titus, who dies of pneumonia, and who will reign until he's assassinated on his magnificent palace on the Palatine Hill in 96. So he fought some German wars, maybe not so successfully, but he does have a massive building project, which you could say is quite successful in the city of Rome, in particular, that palace designed by his architect, Rabirius. And his reputation is terrible. He was assassinated 
the Senate appointed a uh, Senator Nerva as his successor. First time they did that successfully. And then he in turn, Nerva, chose Trajan, a successful general, as his heir. He went around being called Dominus et Deus, master and God. What a, what a way to be called as a ruler of Rome. And it's that sort of term Dominus we have in the life of Augustus, according to Suetonius, that Augustus did refuse that term. So it's a very powerful term. It implies that you are Dominus, the master, and the other people are the slave. Uh, so Lord and God, as in living God, is a pretty in-your-face terminology for yourself and ultimately leads to that subsequent assessment of Domitian as one of grand negativity, let's put it that way. And he in his life, as other emperors and individuals, had their affiliations with individual gods. For Augustus, it was Apollo. For Domitian, it was Minerva and her many manifestations. And in particular, in his forum, which you see above on the uh, um, top image is a uh, reconstruction then of the various forum spaces. It's the smallest one, it's the most narrow one. And we know from archeological evidence that Domitian was planning on building something much larger that is ultimately taken over by the construction of the form of Trajan. So Domitian was always searching and, and seeking to build something quite large, more so than the foreign transitorium that has his name on it, uh, a mere 160 meters long by, by 46 meters, but it's completed ultimately and attributed to Nerva. So it's also known as the form of Nerva, even though it was pretty much all built by Domitian. It had its own temple that you see here, still standing in the 16th century uh, in the Diparac Drawing. And, um, and some of the colonnade on the right, which we'll get a view of in a video just shortly. But it's within that decoration that's still visible today that you have allegorical stories that are depicted. Stories like Arachne, who competes against Minerva, as the mythological story goes, in a weaving contest and ultimately is punished for her hubris to challenge the gods she is ultimately going to be forced to commit suicide, and then Minerva transforms her into a spider. That's why the spider has such a great uh, web, because in her human form, she was also a great weaver. These are the ways in which we tie these stories into the decoration of the forum space, and ultimately, these kinds of images that are preserved underline the divine order, hubris on the part of the humans, reverence for the gods. Various stories are told in these depictions. And of course, it's in that space along what was originally the Arbolitum Street that we have a video on on Ancient Rome Live, as well as the Forum Transitorium and all Imperial Forest spaces, that that Arbolitum Street was also a focal point for a lot of businesses, including that of booksellers. So here is a view of that same pair of columns that you see in the Deparac drawing on the far right, now excavated out. And we can pivot up. We'll take a look at that frieze in more detail. There's an image of a province up at the top panel. And it's that very frieze then that narrates a little snippet of the what would have been something quite impressive on both sides for a length of 160 meters, quite an impressive narrative of many allegorical stories, many scenes in mythology, quite possibly other shrines and cults dedicated to the goddess Minerva. We don't think this was just repeated over and over and over again, but there are other narratives, other stories, as we see, let's say on the Augustan um, Basilica Amelia frieze reliefs, uh, or we see a narrative along the uh, column of Trajan. This was a, a quite sensational image that we have uh, preserved. And there's a great book by Eve Dambra on private lives and imperial virtues that really tackles the issues of the frieze of the possibilities of the other stories that are long gone and lost, uh, of the ways in which this uh, form decoration declares that allegiance to the patron goddess of the form and the patron goddess of Domitian, that is Minerva. So her temple was indeed right here until it was dismantled to build 
the fontanone that's now on the geniculum hill. So again, we'll take a nice little view, pivot up of this magnificent little portion that's preserved, but very beautifully rendered with these slim uh, Turkish columns and the beautiful narration up on top. The festivities in Rome lasted five days. Again, it's celebrating the birthday of the goddess, again, associated with the foundation of the temple on the Aventine Hill. On that day, people went and consulted fortune tellers. It was apparently a good moment to have your fortune told. And the first day is a day of bloodless celebration, but the next four bring out the gladiators. So you can imagine then it was a great moment in the course of the year to go to the Colosseum and other places throughout the city. And the idea is then it's the month of March and it's all about war, it's all about Mars, but it's also about Minerva, who is also a bellicose deity like Mars. And on the last day, as you're concluding the gladiator fights, you have the tubulustrium, which is a moment to purify the war trumpets, the tubi that are gonna be blasted uh, by the trumpeters as part of the retinue in the Roman military. So every single component of warfare is treated with from the shields to the weaponry to the uh, trumpets that will be blasted. And they're considered also then sacred uh, to be purified every year, implements to conduct war successfully. We can go out to Albano, the Alban Hills, where Romulus and Remus were born. And there are games then that are added by Domitian, we're told, by Suetonius in the life of Domitian, section four. And he ultimately creates a, an association, a collegium, to supervise the various related games. And why up here is because the, another villa another palace constructed by Domitian that maybe isn't common knowledge and most people haven't visited, but it's owned by the Vatican and you can indeed visit it today. It's another magnificent villa that on one side gave you a view of the Alban Lake and on the other side to the left, you'd see the coastline. So it's a magnificent, magnificent location to have an enormous villa. And there, there were exhibitions of wild beast games stage plays, we'll see at the theater in a minute, and competition of orators and poets. So it really was an enormous event that Domitian himself was the key proponent to expanding the festivities to celebrate his own personal deity. These are some, it looks like Versailles here, these are some of the papal gardens that are created over time, over the ruins, and in this case here, we're pivoting toward one particular large cryptoporticus, you can see all those holes, those windows. I'm gonna take you inside in a minute. But literally there was a walkway then constructed on a barrel vault, several hundred meters long. Take away the trees there, right? On the, to the right, you'd walk over and you'd be able to see the Alban Lake. And if you pivoted uh, to, the, to the left, where we started our little video, you'd see the coastline. So you'd have a magnificent uh, sunset. Now we're inside this long corridor and we can just get a sense. It was once lined with marble and we're getting a sense of scale. So it's within this property where we're getting a sense of an enormous scale that you had the guests come, you had the entertainment, and you had all kinds of venues for poets, the orators, the sta stage play performances, and feast hunts. Here's a little view of the theater. There's the stage right there, and we're pivoting to the space for the seating. So it's not the large theaters like we have in the city of Rome, the Theater of Pompey and Marcellus and Balbi, but it is a smaller venue within the palace of Domitian, quite magnificent.